Hello, my name is Petra Lewis. I'm a radiologist at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in the Geisel School of Medicine in Dartmouth, New Hampshire. I'm gonna to talk to you today about MRI guided biopsies, both the technique of these biopsies and some of the tips and challenges involved. Here are my learning objectives. By the end of this one hour session, the attendee should be able to identify which lesions require an MR guided biopsy, describe the equipment used for MRI guided biopsies, list the steps involved, identify common MR breast biopsy challenges and be able to modify procedures to overcome those challenges. And then finally, to manually target a lesion in case of software failure. So you're the radiologist who's responsible for breast procedures that day, and you see this report. Lesion two, right breast, was not visible by ultrasound, and an MRI-guided biopsy is recommended. Well, depending on how much you enjoy these procedures, your reaction could be this. Oh, darn. Oh, yay. So what kind of lesions require MR-guided biopsy as opposed to some other form of image-guided biopsy? Well, BIRADS four or five lesions that are not identified on a second look ultrasound. But there are some lesions that we tend to send straight to MR-guided biopsy because we have it readily available rather than for second look ultrasound for reasons that we'll talk about in just a moment. One are small masses and small is going to depend on the size of the breast and where the mass is located in the breast, but sort of under eight millimeters or perhaps under six millimeters in somebody who has a smaller breast. Non-mass enhancement, the uh, correlates of this by ultrasound tend to be weak um, and sometimes not very good correlation, so non-mass enhancement, we will tend straight to MR-guided biopsy. Patients who have a lot of very complicated breast pathology or anatomy, so lots and lots of stuff going on in the cyst, perhaps there's uh, multiple different areas that are enhancing, but you only want to biopsy one of those. Um, I would send them straight for MR-guided biopsy, and also in patients who have larger breasts in, in whom there are significant challenges in finding the ultrasound correlates. Here's an example of a small mass that we sent straight to MR guided biopsy. So this is a patient's index lesion. It already been biopsied and shown to be invasive lobular carcinoma. This is a staging breast MR. And this second uh, lesion, which was a significant distance in the primary lesion was identified. We felt it was too small to reliably detect by ultrasound. And she went straight to MR guided biopsy. And this was an additional focus of invasive lobular carcinoma. This patient with larger breasts had a area of linear non-mass enhancement. Uh, this turned out to be DCIS at biopsy. A patient who has quite complex breast pathology with an awful lot of cysts, you can see here on the enhanced subtraction image. And we were interested in this linear area of non-mass enhancement, so we took her straight to MR-guided biopsy, and this was also DCIS. Just a few basic tenants. When you see an abnormality on a diagnostic breast MR, you want to make sure you always review the mammogram, um, one that's under six months um, old, preferably. You want to make sure that any lymph nodes or fibroadenomas or calcifications are identified that could account for this abnormality. If you see a potential correlate on the mammogram, then do diagnostic mammography unless it's clearly benign um, and or stable. Um, but if the mammogram is normal, repeating mammography is really helpful. This is an example where a small mass was seen on the patient's diagnostic breast MRI for high risk screening. When we went back over her mammogram, she's had a stable lymph node at that site for many years, and we just passed this as BIRADS2. So many of the BIRADS4 and 5 abnormalities that you see on her, on a patient's breast MRI um, should go for second look ultrasound. It's definitely the easiest way to biopsy concerning lesions, but you must be extremely careful with your correlation. The lesions can actually even be in a totally different quadrant because you have the MR performed with the patient prone, and then you're having the ultrasound performed with the patient supine with their arm up. If you have any questions about the correlation, then just go straight, go and decide to do an MR guided biopsy, even if you have an equivocal um, ultrasound correlate. Or the alternate is, um, especially if you don't have readily available MR biopsy slots, is leave a biopsy clip and then repeat a limited non contrast MR to make sure it correlates to the right site. And I'll show you an example in a moment. 
When you are correlating the ultrasound to the MRI, you need to look at a number of different variables. You need to look at the site of the lesion, both clock face and distance from nipple, remembering again that difference in positioning, and also that you can have some lesions that, for example, on the MRI are in the deep central breast, right behind the nipple, and so perhaps this is seven centimeters from the nipple by MRI. But when you ultrasound the supine patient, and that deep central lesion can be directly behind the nipple, so zero or one centimeter from the nipple. You need to check the shape. You don't want a lesion that is speculated on the MRI to be correlated with something that's a nice smooth round lesion on the ultrasound. The size of the lesion obviously needs to be uh, fairly closely correlated, how deep in the breast parenchyma it is, and also the surrounding tissue. So I will look at a lesion on MRI and I will say, okay, this is deep in the breast and it's surrounded by fat. And I'm expecting on the ultrasound image to see a lesion that is deep in the breast again and surrounded by fat, not something that is superficial and surrounded by dense breast parenchyma. Here's an area of non-mass enhancement early in our, our breast MR biopsy experience, which was identified just lateral to an excisional cavity here. And you can see it here on the sagittal image. This was worked out by one of my colleagues who felt there was a reasonable ultrasound correlate for this abnormality and it was biopsied. And at the time of biopsy, a clip was left and the patient immediately went over to MR and had a short limited non-contrast MR. You can see the original lesion here on the left and on the right is the position of the biopsy clip, which you can see is discordant from that area. And the patient then went to MR guided biopsy and this was DCIS. The original biopsy had come back as benign fibrocystic change. Let's run through the requirements for performing an MR guided biopsy. Well, you either have to have a specific dedicated breast biopsy table or a tabletop unit that goes on top of your regular MR table. And there are, there are multiple manufacturers who make this. You need to have an MR compatible vacuum assisted biopsy device. Note that it's only the device itself that needs to be MR compatible because the um, machinery is outside of the room and it's just run with a long cord. You need to have some kind of an MR bright fiducial for the localization and MR compatible biopsy market markers, which virtually all of them are now. And then targeting software is nice, as you'll see in a minute, but it's not necessary. This is an example of a dedicated breast biopsy table. This is the um, in vivo or sentinel table from GE. And you can see the patient lies with a head here. You've got lots and lots of room, really good access under the patient for doing the biopsy or take breasts of um, you know, quite a large size with no problem. This is a tabletop unit. So it goes on top of your regular table for MR and the patient lies on this with their breasts through the holes here. This is a Siemens unit. Um, it has some disadvantages that it, it's more difficult to get larger breasts in. You can see that they're going to um, sort of puddle against the breast there. And if you have larger patients, their back may be up against um, the top of the uh, MR gantry. This is an example of a patient who's positioned on a different sort of tabletop unit. I think this is also uh, from GE in vivo. And you can see here that if she was a large lady, that it can cause some issues uh, with getting her into the gantry. This is what we use for our biopsies. We use an ATEC. Um, this is the MR version, as you can see on it. Uh, we also use a similar version for ultrasound guided vacuum assisted biopsies. Um, so this section here is all MR compatible, but this box stays out of the room with just a very long lead um, and tubing going to the ATEC advice, device. There are several options for targeting software, which does facilitate you targeting. As I said, it's not necessary and we'll learn how to do it manually because sometimes it doesn't work, um, such as Dynacad, which is shown here, or Multiviews, another system. And I'll just show it to you in a little more detail when we go through an example. The disposable supplies that you need to have on hand are an MR compatible biopsy device kit, including the needle block, betadine sticks for cleaning through the grid, 1% lidocaine without epi and with epi, 
22 gauge or 23 gauge needles for injecting the epinephrine and if a patient has a larger breast or deeper lesion you may need a longer needle a scalpel gauze tape and steri strips here are the different components of the biopsy kit that come packaged together so this is the sheath and it has this little uh, marker on here that gives us the depth it's attached to a length of tubing so that you can give local anesthetic through the back of that into that introducer sheath goes the stylet to be able to get it into the patient these two elements go through the needle block which identifies where um, in which part of the grid that needle is going to be inserted and this is a t1 dark obturator they come in different um, varieties which we put in once we've taken the stylet out you don't want to put the patient in the magnet with the stylet in this is by a different manufacturer just to show you um, something slightly different but it's the same components in terms of a introducer sheath a titanium stylet a plastic obturator in this case this is t1 bright rather than t1 dark um, and we'll see some examples of this in a bit and this is a slightly different needle block in this case it locks into the grid so the first step is planning your procedure i try and do this the day before preferably to identify any problems you can only come from lateral or medial you cannot come from cranial cordal or from below and we usually we go to the closest surface but if it's sort of central breast it's easier to come from a lateral approach than a medial approach you need to identify any potential challenges and we're going to talk about those in the next section of the talk plan the modifications you need to do and communicate with the technologist for those to be done and then if you're using a worksheet which i'll show you mark your anticipated lesion site on the worksheet so we're going to work through a biopsy of this lesion here so here is our area of uh, focal non-mass enhancement here it's in the slightly lateral right breast you can also see it right up here and so we're going to choose to go from a right lateral approach this is a worksheet that's supplied by the manufacturer which is specific for uh, particular grids this is for the sentinel grid plate and that's you have to pick the correct worksheet there's two getting the one for the lateral right breast here and what I do is I usually just sort of sketch on here what I expect the breast to be looking like and where on the sagittal I think it's going to be and then I will do the same over onto um, the other workshop the other worksheet which is going to be what you're going to see on the viewer and again just marking c5 there and this just helps the technologist know how to position the patient's breast within the coil and the grid depending on where you're going for a lesion notice on this workshop this worksheet for the lateral right breast we have head here and feet here this is for the lateral left breast and medial right breast and in this case it's the opposite projection with feet here and head here positioning the patient appropriately for biopsy is absolutely key for a successful biopsy you may use an MR technologist but at least initially I would suggest that you use the mammography technologist to help the MR technologist position well they are so good particularly if a patient has a particularly challenging biopsy you need to have that lesion within the grid or you're not going to be able to biopsy it the compression needs to be sufficient that you have adequate grid contact at the site that you're going to go into the skin but you don't want it over compressed if you over compress the breast a it can be very thin and challenging to biopsy but also the enhancement can be either absent or markedly decreased here's a patient who's positioned in the grid of an MR biopsy coil you can see that grid sitting right here it looks like she's got good compression against the entire breast throughout but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to poke my finger into one of these holes and feel how tight that breast is at this point the T1 bright marker fiducial is also placed in one of the grid boxes you can see it here this little orange one some of them come in automatically set in cubes that you push in and the position of that marker should be identified on the worksheet 
Now, you might think I'm insane, I possibly am, but that breast tissue should feel like a medium rare steak. So here's an example of how you test for whether your steak is rare, medium rare, medium or well done, um, just on the, the um, thin eminence of your hand. Do exactly the same in the patient. You just poke your finger through the grid and feel how tight that breast tissue feels. So if I was going for this lesion here, the blue star, my grid contact is adequate. But if I was going more anteriorly to the red star here, this air gap here is going to cause a problem. When you try and put the, the uh, stylet with the introducer in through the breast tissue, it's going to push away from you. It's going to be very difficult to get it in the breast and get reliable positioning. And I'm going to talk about how we can improve grid contact of anterior lesions later on. The imaging sequence may vary between institutions, but here's a basic sequence. First of all, you're going to do your timeout to make sure it's the correct patient, the correct side, and so on, the scout imaging, and then do a T1 fat sat sagittal image sequence without gadolinium. And what you need to do when you look at this image sequence is check that the expected position of the lesion is within the grid. It's got good contact with the grid at that site and that you can see the fiducial marker, which is identified on the sagittal images for targeting software and for manual targeting. This is then followed by a T1 fat sat axial pre gadolinium sequence. And in this sequence, review it again, work out where you think that lesion is going to be using your uh, original diagnostic breast MR as your guide. Make sure that they've included enough breast tissue, but not too much, so that you're not having an unnecessary number of slices for each of your post-GAD sequences. And then just uh, double check the depth that you anticipate the lesion to be on that study that's going to help you guide what sort of needle you're going to use and make sure you can biopsy shallow lesion, lesions safely. Following this, the next sequence you do is T1 fat sat axial. Um, with uh, peak enhancement, so usually about 40 seconds after injection of gadolinium. You may also do a sagittal sequence at that time and subtraction images. Those latter two may not be needed if you have targeting software, which will do those automatically, um, but I've found them extremely helpful if you're doing manual targeting. When you've identified the lesion on this original set of images, you want to correlate it very carefully with the diagnostic study. The patient's breast is likely to be in a slightly different position and certainly different compression. There may be a different coil number, so the images for the biopsy study may not be as high a quality as for the diagnostic study. And so you have to look very carefully at glandular and vascular architecture to confirm it is the same lesion. You'll target the lesion either manually or using specific software and also target the fiducial. We'll to go through those individually. So here's an example of how different the breast looks between the two studies. On the left is the diagnostic study, and then at the same level, um, the patient who is going to be having a medial approach to a biopsy, the lesion's not shown here, um, at the same level of the nipple, and you can see how different the breast looks. Another example of a patient who has segmental non-mass enhancement, this entire quadrant of the breast here, um, diagnostic study, it looks like on the left, and then when you come to the biopsy study, and we were wanting to biopsy the most anterior extent of this, as so she'd already had a posterior biopsy stereotactically, um, you can see that the breast looks completely different. In fact, up here, this breast was only um, two and a half centimeters thick, even though the enhancement went up as far as her nipple. So this was about as far um, out towards a nipple as we could biopsy. So either you or the software is going to work out in which grid position the target is and in which grid position the fiducial is. And we state the target position relative to the fiducial position. We know where the fiducial is, and then the target might be perhaps two squares towards the chest and one square towards the feet. Within that grid square, you usually have an option of nine different needle positions depending on where the lesion is within that grid to increase your accuracy. So you want to know where it is. So perhaps it's in the top middle hole of that grid. You can calculate the grid, the, uh, calculate the lesion depth by measuring it on the axial images 
or from the sagittal slice position. The measurements on the introducer, plastic introducer, include a offset for the depth of the grid, so you usually do not need to add that on. So let's see what this looks like in, in the um, a software package. This is Dynacad's Dynalock system. On the left, we have listed a whole load of different parameters, um, such as the approach, left breast needle approach, and what the needle is. In this square here, it is a sagittal image, which shows us the grid and the T1 bright fiducial. You can see that in that little red square, and we will click on that. Just right below it is the uh, subtraction axial image. And we have targeted the lesion as shown by the small green circle here. And it will then come up with my lesion coordinates. Here's the fiducial marker. And it says I've got to go two squares towards the chest. And I've got to go two squares to the right. And I'll be in the right grid block. And that I should go in the middle right, as shown here, square. And this shows us the depth that we need to go to. This image is a, just a little overlay display that shows me that my biopsy chamber, which is the yellow part, is well within the breast tissue. And here's just a close up of the printout that we get um, that we take into the room with us. Just a word of note here. When you're doing MR guided biopsies, don't think about clock faces. You'll get yourself very confused because they differ between how you're looking at it on the screen and how you're looking at it on the patient. So don't think about 12, 3, 6, and 9 as we usually do with mammography. Instead, think head, feet, and chest, nipple on both the image that we're looking at on the screen and the image, sagittal image, and the sagittal image that we are seeing when we look at the patient. It's going to help you much more. So if you are thinking about how you want to move and uh, change your position or do different biopsies, think that you need to move maybe a little bit to the feet and a little bit towards the nipple. So here's an example of a slightly different sort of fiducial, but the fiducial has been placed in this block here. It only fits in this block here in this particular device. And the software has targeted us to go two blocks to the right and then in the top right hand hole. So proceeding with the biopsy is pretty much standard for any breast biopsy. You're going to clean the skin inside the grid square and we use betadine um, swabs for that. Identify where you're going to be inserting the needle according to your targeting software. Inject 1% lidocaine to the skin and then lido with epi deep into the breast and do good anesthesia and make sure your knee ties nice and deep using that spinal needle if necessary. Make a nick with your scalpel and make that sufficiently large because you often get a lot of skin tethering when you try to put in the introducer. You place a stylet within the plastic introducer and you set the little rubber marker on the introducer to the depth that already been calculated. In this case, it's 33 millimeters because it's taken off the distal end of the bung. Once that stylet's in the introducer, you put the entire that unit into the appropriate needle um, hole block. You line up the block with the grid and gently insert the stylet through the skin rotating the, no, the needle as you do. Once you've got that introducer below the level of the skin, you can then push the block in and go to depth. I'm going to show you this being done on a movie in just a moment, but just to show you an example of the setup here. So we've got that uh, introducer, we've got the stylet, that little depth marking ring, it's been inserted through the block. And notice the stylet comes quite a considerable distance beyond the introducer. I'm going to show you an example of this being done. So you can see here she's got the stylet being wiggled with a rotatory motion into the breast, getting the plastic introducer below the skin before she moves the block forward, locking the block in position. This particular system has a lock and then making sure it's at the depth as identified by that little plastic ring. You then remove the stylet and you put in the plastic obturator before the patient goes back into the unit. This particular MR biopsy system uses, instead of one fiducial, two separate fiducials. At this point, we run the axial series again, and you may want to add a sagittal or you may not, it's up to you. And this is being used to check the position of the obturator tip 
or the contrast column and calculate if we need to adjust anything at all. And, and we'll talk more about adjustments later on. Very easy to adjust the depth by putting the stylet back in and either withdrawing it slightly or pushing it forward slightly. So here's an example. Um, in this case, we're using a T1 dark obturator. You can see my obturators here. So the tip of my obturator is about eight millimeters shallow from the area of non-mass enhancement that I want to biopsy. So we pushed in another eight millimeters. This particular system, the tip of the obturator is the middle of the biopsy chamber. Here's a system that uses a T1 bright obturator and you can see the tip of the obturator is right at the lesion. So this one is perfectly positioned. At this point, you take the obturator out and you put the vacuum needle in on a biopsy setting. And I usually inject about another 5 cc of lidocaine with epinephrine through the back of the device, rotating it through um, 360 degrees at this time. I then take usually six to 12 biopsies. I tend to take more biopsies than I do with stereotactic because we can't image the specimens. So usually closer to 12. Lavage the cavity to get the specimens out, take the biopsy device out and put the obturator back in. At this point, we repeat that axial imaging. We make sure the biopsy cavity looks um, appropriate, that we seem to have included the lesion. If it, you don't feel the biopsy is adequate, work out where you need to repeat the biopsy. So do you need to take some more biopsies towards the nipple or towards the feet and so on? Take further biopsies and then repeat that imaging and look at the cavity again. Here's another example of a slightly different system. We can see linear non-mass enhancement here. This is our fiducial in this system. In this particular system, the obturator contains a T1 bright column only in the area of the biopsy chamber. Um, it tends to have air bubbles in, so it can be difficult to see. We use a different one now. And the biopsy chamber is thus there. And this is after biopsy, and we can see that we have a uh, nice big biopsy cavity right over that lesion, and that was DCIS. When you feel your biopsy is adequate, you can aspirate any hematoma using the device on lavage and then dry lavage. Put the clip in, making sure the clip and the spacer are appropriate for your particular device. Replace the obturator back in and do a quick scan to check the clip position. At that point, if you're happy with everything, you can remove the introducer take the coil and the grid away, and then turn the patient over, which usually involves her kneeling, and then turning over, putting a pillow over the coil. Hold compression on the biopsy site for a good five to 10 minutes, as these do tend to bleed more, and then put steri-strips on. Just an example of clips, I'm sure you're all very familiar with um, biopsy clips. These are N-deploy, and they typically have a very specific spacer that needs to be on the device to make sure it's deployed at the right depth. We then perform a post biopsy mammogram and I've just uh, turned the images here so you can see the correlation, which we check very carefully. So here's the non-mass enhancement on the axial image, slightly medial from the nipple. And here it is the clip, so that looks pretty good. And on the sagittal image, it was up here and the clip was in a good position also. When the results come back, it is extremely important that you perform a correlation with the imaging to make sure that the pathology matches and it is not discordant. And we'll talk more about that in the tips and challenges, which is coming up. So in my guided breast biopsies are not open heart surgery, but they can certainly have some challenges involved. And let's run through a few of them. Challenge number one, it's incredible how often the lesion ends up being targeted onto one of the cross squares of the grid, in other words, not nicely in the middle of a hole. This one's pretty easy to work out. You can go into the nearest hole and then work out what direction you're going to be biopsying. So for example, here you could decide that you're going to be going into, you're going to C6, you're going to the top left hand corner of that, and you're going to be biopsying towards the chest and towards the head. You can see here the markers. And so just make sure that you think about which direction quite carefully. Challenge number two. What happens if you do your first post needle placement scan and you find the obturator is not where you want it to be? 
So for example, in this patient here, here is our lesion. We see no signs of the obturator, but when we scan down, and I'm just keeping a star where the lesion is as I go down, starting to see the obturator here. So in this patient, the lesion indicated by the red star is slightly towards the patient's chest relative to the obturator tip, but it also was several slices below it towards the feet. So I know that I'm gonna to have to biopsy towards the feet and towards the chest in this patient. If you're within about five millimeters, you should be okay. But if more than that, you're going to have to uh, replace your needle, you're gonna to have to do a new skin nick and you have to move pretty fast because your contrast is going to be washing out. If you're within that about five millimeters, however, you should be good. See if you need to adjust the depth at all, work out what direction you're going to biopsy, again, chest, nipple, head, and feet, and take your biopsies in that direction. Challenge number three, the too shallow lesion. And this is very common in both large breasts and smaller breasts. And you can see here that this non-mass enhancement is very close to the skin surface. In fact, this non-mass enhancement was only eight millimeters below the skin surface. Most biopsy chambers are approximately two centimeters big. So if you use your conventional targeting, you're going to take a big skin biopsy and ask me how I know, um, it can take a really big skin biopsy. It can suck in the skin and you can't see it because it's behind that block. So we can use a number of techniques for superficial lesions. Put a lot of superficial lidocaine in to push that lesion a little deeper. Put the biopsy chamber in deeper, such that the lesion is in the proximal end of the biopsy rather than in the middle. If it's really, really superficial, you can do it without the block. It's definitely more challenging, but it means that you can see exactly what's going on. And then you can also use the petite needle, which is a one centimeter or 12 millimeter um, chamber size. I don't like it because I don't like the size of the samples it gives, but I will use it if I have to. So just to illustrate this, this is a sort of a lesion that's nice and deep, and we can put the lesion in the middle of the biopsy chamber. But for a shallow one, push the needle in further and be biopsying more the proximal end, just making sure that that plastic obturator is under the skin surface to keep it safe. Or we can use the smaller petite needle. Challenge number four, very posterior lateral lesions like this. Really tough, especially in small breasts. The key is that you want to get this breast tissue far enough away from the chest wall that you can do a safe biopsy and you need to get it far enough down so it's within the biopsible part of the grid. Here's a couple of tips of how to deal with very posterior lateral lesions. First of all, take the padding off that's between the patient and the plastic of the coil holder. Um, you can get another couple of centimeters with that. Roll the other side up. I'll show you a diagram in a minute of how we do that. And then get the tech to really pull down that lateral tissue. Um, you may find that you have to remove the coil from the grid for biopsy as it blocks the most posterior um, row on the grid. Uh, you can put it back on to image the patient um, after you've put the needle in. So here's an example of a very posterior lateral lesion. If we did conventional positioning, they, it would be behind the grid. We cannot biopsy uh, above the grid. So what we've done here is we've pulled her tissue down and we've rolled the contralateral side up and put a wedge underneath it. And that brings down that lateral tissue so that we can biopsy it. Here's an example of another small focus of enhancement in another patient again very posterolateral you know you're not going to be able to go in like this or you'll be giving a pneumothorax so on the diagnostic study and i've just flipped the images a little bit the lesion was back here but you can see how they've really pulled that breast tissue down look at how pectoralis is now very triangular and this is just a little bit of the lesion showing here that we've now can biopsy that safely Challenge number five, the disappearing lesion. So this is the lesion that you could see on the diagnostic study, and then you come to do the biopsy and it no longer is there. So it's very important that you let patients know that this might happen before the biopsy, so they're not surprised if the procedure stops in the middle. 
first of all, check there has been adequate contrast injection by looking at the heart, looking at the blood vessels in the breast. If you think the breasts may be overcompressed, try releasing the compression and rescanning them. Do some delayed imaging. I often sometimes uh, will repeat two or three more axial series after the contrast bolus and see if that turns up. Subtraction images can be very helpful here. And if there really is nothing to enhance that enhances, well, you stop the biopsy, reassure the patient. But you should really consider repeating the examination in three to six months as there is a five to 10% false negative ratio rate in the literature when this happens. Challenge number six. Very medial lesions are really tough and you really hope to be able to see these by ultrasound. You could actually see this lesion by ultrasound, thankfully, because I think it would have been nearly impossible to be able to biopsy. But the tricks are kind of similar, removing the padding, pulling that medial breast tissue down. In this case, you'll roll up the ipsilateral side. Again, I'll show you that in a minute. And again, you may need to take out the coil in order to be able to get the needle block in and then put it back in just below that needle block. You can also do MR guided needle localizations with angulation. I'm not gonna talk about that further, um, but you don't have the needle block in to do the needle loc in this case. So you can see here a very medial lesion that you're not gonna be able to get at because it's behind the most posterior open row of the biopsy grid. So what we've done here is we've rolled up the ipsilateral side, put a little wedge, under her shoulder on that side, and that brings the medial tissue down to the most posterior row so you can biopsy it. Challenge number seven. Retroareolar regions can be very tricky. It's a very sensitive area for the patient and often the breast compresses very thin and you have very poor contact with the grid in that retroareolar area. So as you can see here with the retroareolar region, you've got very poor contact between the anterior part of the breast and the grid. So you put a wedge, a little foam wedge behind the breast, pushing the breast forward so you've got adequate grid contact as you can see here. You may need to tape this wedge on. So the tricks for these retroareolar re lesions, you can roll the breast such that that uh, retroareolar region comes a little bit further up the breast, that can help. You can use a petite needle if the breast is very thin there, so that's going to give you that sort of 12 millimeter chamber. Pad the anterior breast against the grid as I showed you and use lots and lots of lidocaine. This is a very sensitive area and it's also a little bit more uh, prone to hemorrhage. Challenge number eight, skin tethering. So if, as you put the needle and the introducer in, the skin pushes away from you, you're going to end up displacing that lesion. You can see here in this patient, there's a little skin tethering um, seen at the level of the entry site. How can we avoid this? Make sure that there is good contact between the skin and the grid, as we talked about with the retroareolar area, and adequate compression. Make that skin nick a little larger than you would for normal stereotactic biopsy. Only insert the needle guide block after you've got the cannula, the introducer through the skin. That's going to help pushing, stop it pushing away. And then as you insert it, rotate that um, introducer and the stylet, and that's going to help it slide in easily. Challenge number nine, what to do in patients with implants. Now you can see this little lesion here. It's pretty much impossible to biopsy this, and we just followed it, and it got better. But there are some tricks if you have to do an MR guided biopsy in patients uh, with implants. Um, obviously, always consent them for implant perforation. Using ultrasound or stereo if possible, because they're much easier to do in this situation. And then using the same techniques as you would with a stereo when you position the patient to displace the implant away from the needle track. Now, you do have to remember there is that vacuum effect. So there is, if you're close to the implant, it may pull the breast implant tissue, uh, the breast implant in and perforate it. You can also do a needle, uh, an MR guided needle loc excision. It's a little bit safer. Um, you're not having that vacuum effect. And then sometimes all you can do is perforate the implant and warn the patient that this is going to happen. So this just illustrates the implant displacement technique. Um, you know, this lesion here, you're not going to be able to get at without perforating the implant, but you can displace the implant away and be able to biopsy it safely. 
this lesion in blue. There's no way that you can biopsy that safely using MR guided uh, biopsy unless you perforate the implant. Challenge number 10. What to do with patients with very small breasts? Now this breast kind of looks okay on the diagnostic exam until you look at the scale. And then you can see on the scale, on the diagnostic exam, where there's no compression here, this breast is only uh, less than three and a half centimeters across. Luckily, we have some tools and techniques we can use for thin breasts. You can reduce the compression slightly, but again, you've got to have it adequately stabilized. This is where the, the petite needles, so the 12 millimeter chamber with a blunt tip really comes in to force. And you can also plump up the breast at least somewhat with lidocaine. So if you use a regular needle in a thin breast as shown here, you're going to risk perforating the other side of the breast and also taking a nice skin biopsy at the proximal end. So the uh, petite needle has a blunt tip, so that reduces the risk of perforation in a smaller chamber, so you can do safe biopsies in these indications. Challenge number 11, hematomas. I found that MR guided biopsies tend to be more prone to getting hematomas than stereotactic or ultrasound guided biopsies. This is partially because the breast um, can't easily be accessed to hold compression. It's a longer procedure. And also we tend to take more biopsies, so taking usually around 12 rather than six. So what to do about these? Well, as you know, time and pressure stops nearly all bleeding. So make sure that you hold compression for longer at the end. Try and move as fast as you can through the procedure. And also, before I put the clip in, I always vacuum out the hematoma by putting the needle back in. And then make sure you put a compression dressing on afterwards. Challenge number 12. There's 15, by the way. Clip migration. So I have found that clips tend to migrate much more often um, in MR than they do in stereos, probably again because of the larger biopsy cavity. So you can see here we were biopsying this little uh, focus of enhancement here, but my clip ended up way medial in the breast on this right CC mammogram performed afterwards. You're also more likely to have clip migration if you have a significant hematoma, so make sure that you vacuum that out before you put the clip in. And although we usually do a sequence following the clip, sometimes you can't see it. Um, due to air or blood in that area. I have found that often withdrawing the introducer about five millimeters before I deploy can be helpful. And if it really, really has migrated, you can go back in and under ultrasound guidance, place a clip into the biopsy cavity afterwards. Challenge number 13, what to do about discordant results? So this patient here on their diagnostic imaging had some a clumped linear enhancement, pretty concerning for DCIS. The biopsy, which we felt was in a pretty good position here, came back as being fibrocystic disease. So in several studies, they found that between 8 and 14% of targeted lesions are actually inadequately sampled by MR-guided biopsy if you do a follow-up enhanced MRI a few weeks later. And this ends up with about 2.5% being false negative for the diagnosis of malignancy. So if you think the result may be discordant, first thing you do is check the adequacy of your biopsy, look very carefully and critically at the cavity size and position and the clip position. And then depending on your level of suspicion, you could either re-biopsy by MRI, you could do an MRI guided needle loc or have a surgical excision using the clip placed at the time of biopsy. Or you could do short interval follow-up in six to eight weeks, um, usually rather than six months in that case, to see whether that lesion persists. Challenge number 14, what do you do if you're using targeting software and it fails or collapses or there's a breakdown in the network at the time of the biopsy? You don't have a lot of time to play with. This is where knowing how to manually target a breast lesion can be really helpful. It's the same process. You're calculating the depth, you're identifying what square the grid it goes in, and then you're identifying the needle position within the grid square. And this is why I like to have my biopsy worksheet there with me, even if I'm using targeting software. So in this case, we've marked here the position of the fiducial marker on both views. And after that, it's really kind of like a game of battleships. 
So here's our original diagnostic study showing this focus of non-mass enhancement in the upper outer quadrant of the right breast. Here's the same lesion shown on the biopsy, initial post-gadolinium sequence. We're going to note the slice position that we see this on the sagittal e sequence and then place a cursor over the lesion as shown by the X here and then scroll back to the grid face. So now we've scrolled back through the images. We've come to the face of the grid. We've kept our cursor on the screen in the same position and we can identify exactly where this grid face slice is. And now we want to scroll back a little bit further to find where our fiducial is. And now we can see our fiducial here and we can see which square it's in relative to our cursor mark here. So the images showed us that we were one square towards the head of the patient on the sagittal image view and we're in the top right hand corner, which is uh, square C5 with B6, these two here. And we just take those markings and we transfer them to the patient view and we use that to guide our biopsy. The depth we can calculate by the measurements, the position slices that, from the grid face and the target and just subtracting them. Or you can use your axe, your images, and then just calculate the depth from those. And then just the same as you did with the targeting software, use your guide worksheet to work out where to put the needle block. This is not in exactly the same position as we calculated from the prior study as my fiducial was in the way and I won't be able to show it to you. And your depth gets set, set exactly the same from the calculations as it does from the targeting software I showed you previously. Phew, our last challenge, number 15. Hopefully I haven't put everybody off doing MR guided biopsies by now. What do you do if the patient has more than one lesion to biopsy? Well, it's very helpful if you have a second radiologist or you have a radiology resident who can help you with this. You do need two grids. You can do more than one lesion from the same approach. So say the left lateral approach. You can do lateral and medial from the same breast. So a left lateral and a left medial approach. You can do bilateral lateral approaches, but what you can't do is bilateral medial or medial lateral. My suggestion of workflow for multiple lesions is do all the targeting at the start, introduce both of the introducers and the obturators, take an image, then biopsy lesion one, take an image, place a marker, biopsy lesion two, take an image and place a marker. If you have two sets of equipment, including two vacuum assisted devices um, and two people working, you can do these at the same time. I'll be happy to address any questions in the Q&A session or um, look on YouTube. I have a number of videos about uh, breast MR and other uh, radiological and non-radiological um, topics. And um, Dr. Kapasi and Ho, who I use their video clip, also has a very nice video series about breast MR guided procedures. Thank you for listening.